All right. So welcome to our fifth and final session of uh, Listening for Spirit in Wilderness Times. And tonight's topic is about listening forward uh, daily practices, practicing in daily life. So I'm going to light our candle and have our minute of silence to begin with. If you have a candle, please join me. A reminder of the light that's in all of us, and that we carry the light and we are the light and there is light. Sometimes it seems really dark, but there's light. And then we'll do our minute of silence. Um, so if you wanna just get yourself in a comfortable position and one in which you can have a deep breath and relax for a moment and let's breathe together as we start our time tonight. Hmm. Okay. So last week, um, we talked about the practice of becoming present, listening to others. So are there any comments or questions uh, or insights that came to you over the past week about the presentation or the, the uh, exercises that were there for you? Anything that you noticed this past week about listening to others? Or anything else that we've talked about? Did anybody do any of the practices? A mindfulness minute or anything like that? Well, I know I've tried to um, pause when I'm with people hmm. just to introduce an extra 10 seconds of wait, don't jump in and speak, but just pause. Mm -hmm. And that takes practice when one is used to always talking. Yeah. Any particular experience that you had with that or just in general? No, but I know it's good <laughs> because the other person is aware hey she's not she's not talking she's available she's listening mm, great thank you anyone else have anything to add here yeah john unmute i gotta say it's very difficult to to sit and listen for anything with the damn grand prix running <laughs> outside my window and um, I found myself going up to Starbucks, which is a long ways away, sitting, drinking coffee, and rejoicing in a little less noise until the fire engines go by. But, but it's been interesting. 
Well, you've, uh, you've, yeah, you've become aware of a lot of noise around your house. Yeah. <laughs> and, and just to, don't want. Ahead. So anyway. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. wasn't Diana? last week, but um, John said something the week before. I was reading a poem today and John, I can't remember what you said about reading poetry, but it was, it was really good. Can you re remind me what that was? Well, I spoke uh, when when we heard the um, the nine points for listening. Um, I said if I had had those to to in front of students when I was introducing poetry to them, it would have been really really useful. Good. It was the nine points. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. And Judy, you're muted, sweet. In our small group um, at Robert and Laurie's, and it's Robert and Laurie and Anne and Byron and I have just had this delightful small group on Tuesdays. And one of the things we talked about um, it was quite an interesting discussion was my question from a couple of weeks ago about when you have the group having a deciding point about <clears throat> who's starting the birth dates or alphabetical or something mm -hmm. because we talked about the fact that that it always comes up when anybody's setting ground rules of the talkers and the not talkers and of course, Anne Burdett and I are the queens of the talkers. And Laurie's somewhere in the middle. Byron and, and Robert are only talk to talk when, when it's absolutely necessary. So, and, and in my small group last time, it was uh, McKinsey and Ben Hameen and Jill. And I said to myself, I'm not going to be the talker. I'm going to sit here and wait for one of the three of them to start. And we sat for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And finally, I said clearly, <laughs> expecting I will be the one that's going to start. So we sit here all night. And um, so mm -hmm. then we talked about this more at, at Lori's house. And we thought, for those of us who have a hard time not talking, parameters really are important. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And sitting around and waiting for the spirit to move someone, those of us who are trying really hard not to talk and not to jump in and not to be the one, some of the reason is that we have great discomfort with the person that's in charge not having anybody talk. You know, hmm. it's kind of like a, a helping thing more than, oh, I've got <laughs> this burning thing I have to say. It's a care, caregiving thing. Um, but that... The, oh. the, often not always um but the the pressure on the talkers and the non-talkers when it's not clear this idea of just sitting there till the spirit moves you doesn't really do it for uh for a lot of people so i i i'm just thinking that one of the things that that probably is important in any kind of of, of thing that it isn't isn't just literally speak when the spirit moves you is to have a designated starting point and an assumption that everybody will talk unless they specifically don't want to. And yeah, that's a good good point, Judy. And that's one of the reasons that to use, you know, the, the birthday or the alphabet or something is, is to so that that starts it going. Uh, and of course, when we're in person, we can have the listening piece or the talking piece, you know, some kind of a uh, a stone or, or some in something that you pass around the circle or sometimes put it on the center of the circle and then people will take it as they feel they want to speak. But that's another way to um, make have everyone speak and have someone start. It, do you have something, Byron? Yeah, um, it, when I was with the Sheriff's Department, we had there was a, a method of, of dealing with groups of people who've been in, in a traumatic situation, a, a structured kind of debriefing. Mm -hmm. And I used to be fairly loose about doing that. And I had a colleague who, she was very, she followed the, the regimen. You were supposed to do this, I'd go around and have everybody speak this way mm -hmm. and then do it, about this thing. And it would, it would go down into levels. And I, I was much more freelance about it. And one time I observed, I sat in when, when she ran one of them 
and I could see that by having it structured, people opened up way more and much easier. People who would find it difficult or people who even thought, oh, this is a crock. What are we doing here? You know, would, mm -hmm. would eventually by the end of it, because it would go around, they didn't have to talk, but, it, you know, this yeah. person before them and modeled it. And it, you know, it just built a kind of, uh, of an expectation because <clears throat> a lot of us don't even know whether we want to talk or not ourselves, you know, mm -hmm. and it helps us just participate. Oh, We're in there. Yeah. Right. Gotcha. And Every it, single time. Yep. The other thing about yeah. that is that what what uh, what you said and what Judy said too is that this notion of just talking to talk. Uh -huh. uh, and again, that's part of the practice of silence and being comfortable with silence. Uh -huh. So that's another aspect to it. See, it's this all this whole thing, it's it's just not a linear. Uh, experience yeah. it's just that it, it comes and it goes and you find oh silence is oh I see that that's so it's valuable to be comfortable with silence in those kind of situations too and offer people the opportunity and, and people will speak in small groups where they won't speak in large groups and so we're you know we're all different we all have different ways of of communicating and responding to, to, to each other and so these are all just various practices and and uh, we'll, I've got lots of more, lots more practices tonight. So I think we'll we'll get moving on on that part. Marquita <coughs> has her hand up. Who does, Marquita? Marquita. Oh, there you are. <laughs> yes, Marquita. I, I just want to say that I think personally, these exercises and these sessions or what have you, I have become more aware that for me, not talking is more natural. Mm -hmm. And I know some people who know me will probably say, you got to be kidding me. But <laughs> I, my early childhood, I was, I was very, very shy, soft-spoken. But I have found that it's much easier to listen. Mm. And, some, and some of the early careers that I had considered, you know, psychotherapy, uh, were, were you know, based on listening. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I'm starting to sit, think, you know what, I just, I wish I had shut up a long time ago and started, <laughs> I think I would have learned a lot more. And um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's not what I expected. I, I, I went into this, you know, trying to figure out, okay, thinking maybe, you know, I don't listen and I don't, but, but I'm thinking that maybe listening mm -hmm. is my, maybe some of us are more wired to listen and others are more wired to speak. Mm -hmm. And and I was forced at an early age to to learn to speak up and you know we, you know from a baby because say this say papa say you know when we get learning to talk you always learning but maybe the the natural nature maybe for some of us it is more natural to listen mm -hmm. so this is the new me I'm gonna be uh, listening more <laughs> back to my true self wonderful <laughs> well tonight we're going to uh, explore three different approaches to this daily practice of, of listening and taking this forward and the first one is called the top 10 powerful listening practices it's a general overview of everything we've done so far but just a slightly different format then we're going to look at briefly a uh, 11 what it's called 11 tips for making hard conversations work and then we're going to explore some different kinds of conversations. We, the, I remember I, we talked about dialogue and discussion, and we're going to add some more to that. And then I'm going to introduce some ideas about the spirituality of listening. And we'll do a practice, a sort of a guided meditation on the spirituality of listening. And we'll also have some time in small groups in a breakout session. So that's the overall structure and plan for tonight. So I'm going to begin with the uh, top 10 listening practices. And um, this is, these are um, some things that have, you know, I, I started it many years ago and when, when it was, uh, uh, what was his name? The guy who did the top 10 and you'd, he'd go down 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, day, what was his name? You know, the, the comedian? David Letterman. Letterman. Thank you, David Letterman. <laughs> And I, so I, that's when I first wrote these out. And then I thought, well, they're, they're good to, we can still use those. We can start with these. So uh, they're kind of simple in, in many ways, but the first one uh, is, and, and uh, by the way, you will get handouts of all of these things at the end of tonight when, when they get mailed out to you. But, uh, whoops, I'm gonna go backwards here. Uh, the first one is, you know, stop talking. 
that seems such so simple. You know, one person speaking at a time, that seems like that, that would be a good idea. But people say that one of the most irritating uh, habits, listening habits that people experience is that of someone interrupting them. And we do that a lot in our culture. It's just uh, something that has, has become almost normal in the way we speak is to interrupt each other. Otherwise we feel that we're not gonna have a chance to speak at all. But there's an idea that we have two ears and, uh, and uh, one mouth for a reason, and that we probably should listen twice as much as we speak. So <laughs> something to keep in mind. Uh, sometimes though, we, the way that we are wired, I think, in our, in our society is that, that's, that we, um, we don't even realize when we cut people off. It just becomes so acceptable. So the, if we wanna listen, we cannot interrupt. It's not possible to talk and listen at the same time. So the idea here is kind of notice when, when you, you, you sort of start interrupting somebody and, and see if you can't stop yourself from interrupting and what happens when you do that. That's the first practice. And then the, another part of this practice is, is to um, just remember the definition of how, what it is to become a listening presence. It's, it's where it's a way of being in which stillness and attentiveness provide that space in which someone can speak and know that they have been heard. It's that sense of becoming a midwife for someone else's thoughts. So just have, have be, ask yourself, you know, just stop the, uh, stop talking and listen. The second one is to pause before speaking. And that's already come up a couple of times this evening. Allow the person who is speaking time to complete their thoughts. And this is something that is, doesn't often happen somehow in our culture. We, we find ourselves just speaking, talking, talking. And again, this interrupting here that, that we continue to do. So wait, you know, take a deep breath or wait a few seconds before you speak. Like Hillary was saying, she's been trying that this week. And uh, then the other, one of the other things that you can think about is that if there is silence, sometimes that, that, that silence honors what's been said. So it's an okay silence to wait for that, the, the thoughts to come up for someone else to speak and say what they have to say. Number three is listen to yourself, be in touch with your own inner voice. Ask yourself what wants to be said next or what wants to be done next. And the more you know about yourself, the easier it is to know when it's time to talk and when it's time to listen. Asking the question opens the way to your inner wisdom by reminding you to reflect from that deeper level. Just ask yourself that question. Number four is listen for understanding. You do not have to agree with what you hear or even believe it to listen to understand the other person. And here in our, in our culture, we're trained to listen for answers. We're trained to listen whether we should agree or disagree with somebody else, whether we like what they're saying or we don't like what they're saying. And knowing that to receive what someone is saying does not mean that you have to agree with what they're saying. It's really powerful, especially in those situations where that are very emotional or where we're polarized, where we, uh, we have uh, become some, it's a, it's a, a hot topic, shall we say, um, because when you, when you listen for understanding in this way, it, it, it takes away the need to, to refute your, their position or defend yourself. You can just be in, in a more neutral place by just listening to see if you can understand what the other is saying. Try to find value in what that person is saying. Imagine what they're feeling. Try to get a sense of what, what's important in their life, why this is important to them. So listen with that kind of openness. Uh, that's the listening for understanding because you do not have to believe it. And then ask for clarification. Again, if you don't understand what someone is saying, uh, ask. People would much rather have you ask them uh, uh, to clarify what they've said than to, for you to assume you know what they've said. And this also shows, uh, we were talking last week about how do you know, how do you know, show someone that you are listening. And that when you ask a clarifying questions, it, it also shows that you are paying attention and that you care about the person and what, what they have to say. And remember to uh, think about the clarifying questions, uh, the, the question, don't you think that? 
is not a clarifying question because what follows don't you think that is what you think you know it's what i think and you want you it's almost like you're trying to put words into somebody's mouth and when, when i first noticed this one uh i i was it was uh I noticed how often on, on interviews, when people are interviewed on television or in, on the radio, the, the interviewer often says that to somebody and the skilled interviewee will say, well, not really, or they will be able to bring it back to what they, they think because it's just like it is, it's truly, it's like putting, some, putting words in someone's mouth to, to do that. So here we are, now let me move to the next one, oops. So the next one is let the speaker know that you have heard them. Again, we talked last week quite a bit about body language and you know nodding and facial expressions and eye contact. And of course, what I said last week was that eye contact is really important in the Western culture. We, we find that something that, that we count on to know if somebody's listening to us or not. Whereas in other cultures, eye contact is a sign of disrespect and dishonoring. So um, if you don't know what uh, what the, the appropriate uh, body language is in a culture, just ask somebody, you know, say, say, what do you, what is it like for you when somebody, when you, somebody is really listening to you? What do you, what is it? What do you do? What do you notice? What do you see? And that's a way that you can become a better listener for them because you will have the, the, the body language that is appropriate in their culture. And also that handout that you got last week, the phrases in the back that on one of the pages, uh, you know, use phrases to say, tell me more about, or want to help me to understand, or that's really interesting, or what was it like for you? Just to, to continue to show that you are listening to them. And sometimes even a simple, mm-hmm, yeah, is all that somebody needs to keep talking and to, to really, um, be able to express everything that they have to say on a subject. And again, remind the, watch out for the tendency to say, well, that reminds me of, of you know, and then go on to say your experience or um, yes, but, which is also if you, a way of sort of dismissing what they've said because the yes, but means that, that there's something other than what they've just said that you are acknowledging. So just uh, notice, notice those things when you are listening and uh, that will help you become, uh, uh, let the speaker know that you've heard them. Number seven is be patient and present. Listening well takes time and your presence. We speak at about 150 to 200 words per minute, but our brains can process at about 300 to 500 words per minute. So our brains are processing what we hear twice as fast as the words are coming at us. So it's not surprising that our minds wander when, when we're in conversation. So that's the training. That's the, you know, the whole notion of silence and being comfortable with silence and slowing down and being able to let go of all those thoughts that are coming because your brain works so quickly uh, come into play here. And um, we can just let ourselves be more present by letting go of those thoughts and being more mindful, those mindfulness practice that we did last week as well. Uh, number eight is listen with an open mind. Be curious and appreciative of what you're listening to. Listen for new ideas instead of judging and evaluating. Okay, so this one is like, listen with your heart and don't be rehearsing what you're going to say. It's, it's very tempting to start preparing how you're going to respond when they're finished. And yet, if you are listening intently, there's no time to have that internal conversation. One of the things here is it helps to know what your own hot buttons are. What are the things that you know if somebody says X that you are just going to, re, you know, it'll, it'll take you somewhere else and you have strong opinions about something. So if you know what your hot buttons are in a conversation, when someone says something to do that, you can just recognize that, train yourself to recognize, oh, that's, that's a hot topic for me. Uh, I'm gonna let go of that. I'm gonna put it off to the side for now so I can really be present with this person and really listen to them. So just the acknowledging that there are hot topics that take you, they lure you away and you follow the thought that's in your hot button rather than continuing to listen to that person. 
So this is not an easy one to do. It's very difficult, I think, to do that. But on the other hand, it really makes a difference in how you listen to somebody. If you, if you know that that's what, what, what might come up for you, you can say, oh, okay, I'm just going to listen to them now and listen to different points of view. I don't always have to just uh, refute what they're saying or, or you know, think about what, what, I would say, what I would tell them about what they're saying, but just be open to that. So number nine is pay attention to the environment. Stop what you're doing to listen. Turn off the background noise when possible. Move to a quieter corner of the room if you can. Clear off your desk. I mean, it's amazing. It does make a difference, uh, the environment around. If, if, if you know that you're going to have a conversation with someone, you know, look around your, where you are and see what it is that might be a distraction for people. It's, they'd be looking at something else instead of being focused on the conversation at hand. Uh, in, the, in days gone by, when I used to do, do a lot of uh, phone conversations, sometimes I'd have to move away from my desk when I was on the phone because there was too much on my desk to distract me. And you know, the computer was on and there was other, all the stuff on my desk that I'm working on. So I'd have to go, I just literally take the phone and, and move away to another chair so that I could focus you know, on, the, on the phone then. I don't know what the uh, equivalent to that is with Zoom. I guess it's really just focus on the on the on the on, on your screen with the with the person instead of looking at all the other things around it. You know, you're on your desk. So number ten is to listen with empathy and compassion. To just let go of your own agenda for the moment. Put yourself in the other person's shoes. Remember that everybody has a story to tell, and and your task is to listen to the story. Sometimes I, I, with people that I find particularly difficult to listen to, I imagine them as a child, like about a three, four, five-year-old child. And when I can vis visualize this vulnerable little child in each person, then I can start focusing what, on what they're saying um, because I have a clearer heart somehow that it touches my heart when I can do that for people. So then uh, these are the 10. And then at the, at the end of that, uh, notice uh, what happens now. These are some other practices. When you choose to listen and when you choose not to listen. Notice when you experience the art of listening, being a listening presence with another. Notice when you start to interrupt someone and what happens when you don't. Notice when you give the gift of listening to someone else and what it's like to receive it and ask, is there anything else when someone stops speaking? And then finally let go of your agenda to be with another. Whoops, sorry about that. So those are the top 10 listening practices. Any comment on that before we go to these 11, uh, 11 what are they called here? Uh, 11 ideas for making difficult conversations work. Anything anyone wants to ask or comment on with these? See, I can't, let me get, uh, let me get out of here for a moment so I can see everybody. Okay, anything for anybody? Anything come up? Uh, Antonio, did you have your hand up? Uh, yes, uh, Kate, I, I also, by reading at your um, 10 points, I also, it made me think about how sometimes I try to fit a big conversation into a very short, a very short time frame. Mm -hmm. So I want to be more mindful of um, allocating the right amount of time uh, mm -hmm. within a, for a conversation because sometimes I want to rush it, right? Uh, yeah. In that rushing it, I don't listen enough. So I allocate enough time, I think. Yeah. Great. Anything else? Uh, Myron? You're muted. You, you mentioned body language. I, I, I also I also remember they, they used to talk in some of my training about mirroring, which mm -hmm. was that people people when they are hitting it off, if they when they film them, you know, show that they'll start matching each other's movements and so forth. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times I found I used to find when I get it was it wasn't natural for me to do that necessarily, but to consciously do it. I don't, and I'm not trying to advocate. I'm, I'm asking, I guess, uh, 
that when I'd be having difficulty with somebody in a session or something, I'd notice that if I started to consciously kind of mirror them and slow down and match their movements, that it would often loosen up and open up. Mm -hmm. uh, and, th and the thing I'm wondering is, uh, you know, when, when you were talking about that in the environment, that uh, perhaps that is something conscious. I don't know, I haven't thought about it for a long time to, to, to think about my own uh, demeanor matching the other person's, I guess, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. while I'm listening, trying to listen, I don't know. Yeah, that, that is certainly one of the, one of the techniques that is taught is, is mirroring other people. And I, and I think sometimes when in, in the in the art of listening as being fully present, uh -huh. we sometimes automatically do that. Uh -huh. We un unconsciously do yeah, that. Yeah, that's usually where and it opens thing. up the space. Yeah. And that's the, the that's the I think that's part of when when we're really present. Mm -hmm. being fully present that that we we kind of because I, I in looking back I can see that I've done that sometimes but I don't consciously do it yeah. when I'm really there yeah okay anything else was there Alan was that yeah you? yeah just uh as you were talking I just realized that something a number of us do with our homeless clients at uh, the shower program times we have sometimes we have time to talk with some of the clients and certainly to listen to their stories, etc., is easy. We're because we're not really interacting, we're truly listening and we ask questions. But I tell you, it really makes a difference for those few individuals who are on the semi level of uh, fantasy or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I used to think you don't want to, you know, encourage their fantasies. No, ask like one, one guy who's right into cars and everything, and I'm going to buy a new car next week, or well, what kind of car? Mm -hmm. It's not the question, it's the time you're spending with them mm -hmm. and showing them, mm -hmm. you know, a personal interest. Mm -hmm. And and with some of the other people, I see Jane nodding her head, with some of the other people like Chris, <laughs> it's just a test. Is he, is he at all coherent at all? Can I have even a one sentence conversation with him or not. It's just sort of a, a game mm -hmm. just to see how much he's there or not. Mm -hmm. But you are doing something for them mm -hmm. by spending personal time with them yeah. instead of just being, you know, either afraid or just you just don't want to deal with fantasy. Yeah. But you're showing them the attention. And yeah. I think that's what you were getting at before, the key apart of listening is showing the other person attention. Yeah. And that's, mm -hmm. even if it's a little crazy, you're mm -hmm. still doing it. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, right. thank you. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna move on to the, just, we're gonna briefly go over the- the. I was gonna uh, say, Lori did have her oh, hand up. I missed it, I'm sorry, Lori. That's all right. That's oh, it was, a, it was a last minute thought. I, you, you talk about the intention of listening and I've been trying to be so much more mindful. And one thing I realize is how I often listen with an end in mind mm. to reach mm -hmm. a conclusion, yeah. to reach an insight, to have something happen, to put that aside is one of my biggest challenges, but it helps to remember that this is a gift for them. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. So these are, uh, I'm not going to go over these in detail because you'll, you'll be getting these, the 11 ideas for making a hard conversation work. And this is, comes from um, the, uh, what used to be called the Public Conversations Project. It's now called Essential Partners. And they're just some really, uh, I think, very helpful tools for when you're in a difficult conversation. And, you know, if you feel confused, if you feel hurt, if you feel angry, some ideas of the kinds of things that you might say and how you might uh, approach those things in a in a conversation. I just wanted you wanted you to have those because I think they're useful. Um, and we talk a lot about you know the, some of the conversations that are difficult to have. This organization as well has some great the uh, their, I think their website is on the handout, and they have some great tools for specific difficult conversations, whether it's about. Uh, abortion, whether it's about racial issues, whether it's about immigration, they've done some really thoughtful work about helping uh, create and craft some questions that uh, that are designed to help people have conversations rather than fights and arguments and debates. Which brings us to our next uh, 
um, dialogue is a conversation, not a conversion. And these are just some thoughts about talk, talking and listening. Talking, just talking is an intentional and thoughtful way, fully aware of the power of our words, maybe the most revolutionary activity we can pursue. And then this, this other one, again, we've had this from Douglas Steer, to listen in other souls into a condition of disclosure and discovery, maybe the almost greatest service any human being ever performs for another. So I, I love those two quotes. And this brings to the types of conversations that we have. So, and there are probably many more than this, but they, these are, we have personal conversations where we're in a relationship, we're sharing stories, asking for advice, or we're acknowledging something or planning something. And then there are the informational kinds of conversation where we're getting data, we're looking for results, we're taking orders, we're making requests, uh, we're in a school, we're learning. Or meetings, such as formal meetings, such as you know, Robert, anything from Robert's Rules of Orders to a casual agenda. So those are just kind of general types of conversations. But here, the kinds of formats of conversation, I mean, we can go from a debate to an argument to counsel, which is it's used here in the form of like the counsel that uh, indigenous people have when they go to have counsel a consultation, a discussion, a dialogue, brainstorming, negotiation, mediation, counsel, as in counseling, and uh, learning, motivational, social, chit chat. I mean, so we have all these forms of conversation and we, we hardly ever think about what kind of conversation we're in. And so it just expands our notion of the listening that would be appropriate in these various kinds of conversations. And it's just something to sort of open up some new, new ways of thinking about various things as we go through uh, this, this whole big picture of, of communication and listening, and especially listening for spirit. Okay, so uh, we're not ready to go to the breakout rooms yet. Uh, so what I wanna do now is to come out of here and just have, um, briefly talk a little bit about the spirituality of listening. Um, we, we don't, you know, we've talked about listening as a, as a, as a choice, as an art and as a gift and as a, a, the practices of silence, reflection and presence. And also wanna talk about, look a little bit about uh, the spirituality of listening. What is, what is the spirituality of listening? And now I can't, here we go. Um, no, that's not it. What I'm looking for for myself here. I'm looking, oops, sorry about that. Here we go. Um, so let me hold on one second while I get to the right place where I can get to this. Uh, I have a, uh, uh, a uh, guided meditation. And if you have a piece of paper and a pencil, you might want to, or a pen, See if you can grab that because it, you might want to write, jot some things down when I do this little exercise here. Because um, spiritual listening is really at the heart of all relationships. It's, it's the antidote to that missing piece, that longing for connection, that belonging sense of communion, what seems so common today. And this type of listening creates a sense of community. So when we're open to others in this way, we discover a deeper and sacred connections we're in relationship. And we might each have a different way of defining a spiritual experience. And most of them, most people will describe them as those moments when we really get in touch with our sense of wonder and awe. And we're in some kind of communion. We're transcending time and space. They're the kinds of experiences that, that often take your breath away that spirituality is something that connects us to something beyond ourselves and something greater than ourselves as individuals. And those spiritual moments are often sourced with our five senses of sight, smell, taste, and hearing and touch, as well as our intuitive sense. So this little exploration, we're just gonna do a couple, a little taste of this exploration as a way to expand the way we think about listening and spirituality. And there are there actually eight different parts to this. We're gonna just do a couple just so you get a sense of it and you'll get the whole eight in your handout. So find a, get comfortable in your, in your, where you are right now uh, and just 
be a, a moment of quietness and stillness. And this spiritual listening is embodied listening in which we become a listening presence to all of life. Create more space for love and freedom. Hold space for patterns that connect. So the first prompt for you is to, and what we'll do is I'll, I'll read the question and there's uh, three or four questions and, uh, and then I invite you to just take a minute and reflect on those questions before we move on to the next one. And we'll just do three. So the first one is uh, listen to your body. Right now, what is your body telling you? Is it time to rest, eat, move? Does your body need to stretch or dance or play? Is your body too warm or too cold? Are there aches and pains that need tending to? Think about a time when you were grateful for your body. What was that like? What would it take to feel connected to your body again? All right, the next one, listen to your mind. What is your mind telling you? Where are you stretching? Whose voice are you listening to? What are you reading? What are you being called to learn now? Listen to your heart. What is your heart telling you? What do you notice when your heart breaks open? What makes your heart sing? Create a space in which you can unfold. I'm going to end this segment with a quote from Martha Graham. There is a vitality, a life force, a quickening that is translated through you into action. And because there's only one of you in all time, this expression is unique. And if you block it, it will never exist through any other medium and be lost. The world will not have it. It is not your business to determine how good it is, nor how it compares with other expressions. It is your business to keep it yours clearly, 
and directly to keep the channel open. <coughs> so the, the other, I'm gonna just tell you what the other ones are, are. And then when you get the handout, I would invite you to just take this and, and use it uh, when you wanna just sort of take some time out to be in the silence and reflect on the spirituality of listening. Listening to your emotions, listening to your soul, listening to the silence, listening to the earth, and listening to your life. So these are prompts that, uh, that I use that begin with the words listen to. You might also want to revisit them and use the language listen for or listen with. So this is an opportunity to imagine all the different kinds of aspects of listening that we have forgotten or neglected. And now we're going to go into breakout rooms just for 10 minutes, I think, tonight. We're going to so really have a short one. Three How many to have four a... people in groups or yes. four to five? Three, three to four, four okay. please. Yeah. Rejuggle just for a second. Yeah. And I will get the question and stick it in the chat. Just a second here. There we go. Chat. This should be all right. Is the question ready in the chat? Uh, yes. And the question is, um, how do you see yourself applying these principles of sacred listening in your life, at work, and personally? And I think it should be in the chat now, is it? Yeah, there it is. Yeah. All right. Welcome back. Is there, uh, what did you learn that wants to be shared with the whole group? In your 10 minutes together. I want to share a contrast with Marquita and myself, if it's okay, Marquita, just about our experiences with Zoom Church. Mm. We're the exact opposite. <laughs> she felt she could concentrate and Zoom and everything, whereas when she goes to the physical church, there are all these distractions. I'm the opposite. <laughs> Zoom church had too many distractions after a while, and I just needed the quiet of the church. But I'm also an eight o'clocker, Marquita. So um, <laughs> anyway, I just shared that, but it shows how we all are individual and how the spirit comes through us yeah. is very different. So we need to listen and be open to this variety mm -hmm. in all of us. Thank Great. you. Yeah, thanks. Anything else? I I'll have, oh, John, yes. You're muted, John. One thing came up in ours, uh, which I hadn't really thought in connection with what you've been talking about, what we've all been talking about. Mm -hmm. But if I, if I were to sit down with an anti-vaxxer mm -hmm. and we're listening to this person who was saying utter what I think is utter lunacy. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't know how I could accomplish much. I don't know exactly how I could would listen. I, I don't know. I, I that. Do you understand? I, I can't yeah. express. Yeah, it's it, it's hard when when we have strong feelings about things, and they have equally strong feelings about what it is they're saying, even though you completely disagree. And it's like saying something like uh, that. Re that's really important to you. You really have strong feelings about that, and acknowledging that they have strong feelings about it doesn't mean you're agreeing with them. But you're you're. I mean, you can when people are saying things that you totally disagree with, but they're passionate about it, you can say, you're really passionate about what you say. And, or something, even sometimes, you know, um, 
well, you know, how did, how did you, how did you come to those, those conclusions about those things? Not in a way to, to say, you know, that was a, you're wrong, but in a way, you know, I, I want to follow your path. How did you come to this? How did you come to this, this way of thinking? And, you know, just explore with them rather than try to change their mind about it or just, you know, judge them. And it's hard. It's really, really hard to do that. Because <laughs> we know they're wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's, uh, it, it's uh, this, this whole thing, you know, listening looks easy, but it's not simple. Every head is a world is really true. And I just want to show, I, I found, finally found this piece that I was been looking for for a long time that talks about communication styles. And I'm going to just put it up here because I think it just so, so, so interesting. It relates to what we've said just now. Um, these are, this is one person's view of the different kinds of communication styles that we have. And instead of the, I don't use the English and Semitic and Oriental. I use uh, linear and parallel, circular and, and digressive. And these two are both pretty much the same. But so in, you know, in, 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 in linear, it's like you, your communication style is A to B. Shortest point, you know, shortest way between two points is a straight line. I, you just go, you, you're gonna say something and you get to the point straight. Uh, I'm gonna do the circular one next because a, a circular one here, they start here and then they go round and round and round and round and round and telling stories usually along the way and then they get to the point. Uh, this is parallel, what I call, I like to use the word parallel here. And they will say something here, and then they'll say another thing here, parallel to that, and then another one down here and another one down here, but they won't connect the dots for you. You have to connect the dots between these, uh, these four different things that they're saying before they, this is the, their starting point and this is their ending point. And so it's a different communication style. And then this one is digressive. The, both of these are, and they'll start off here and then they'll say, oh, but that reminds me of this. And then they'll come back here and then they'll get back to the main point and then they'll go off here and then they'll come back and then they'll come back and then they'll finally get down to their main point. But I mean, these are just four different, and I, cause this, I don't know why they do these two differently. They just say that, that, that sometimes in this style, which is so funny because of where we are right now in the world, but that, that they, they don't connect the dots for you on, on, on their digression over here. And you have to work harder to understand why, how they got from here to here before they got to here. Whereas the, these people here, they, you, they sort of, you know, they can relate the story to you and as they go off on their digressive points. But anyway, it's just interesting that we have so many, and this is just one way. There's many, many different ways that describe communication styles. But when you think of all the different ways that we communicate, it's amazing that we understand each other at all. Because you know, if you look, if you are, if you're a linear speaker and you're 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 listening to somebody who is a circular speaker, it can drive you crazy, and vice versa. <laughs> you know, and so. Frank, my husband, was very much digressive. And then when we first got together, I, I just was, I, it took him forever to say anything because he would digress and he'd go all over the place. And then I finally realized, oh, that's what he's doing. And then it was like, I, I could listen to the story. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to share that with you because I, I finally found that diagram. I, I've been able to, I had to draw it, but I, I found it just a couple of days ago. Anyway, we are now about a minute to go. And I would just like to say that it's been, I really have enjoyed our pilgrimage together. It's been wonderful to spend these five weeks with you. And everything that I have presented to you is something that I hope you will take and use in any way that you want to, that some of them will resonate and you'll use them at, at work, at home, at, in your community, whatever you're up to and that you listen with a new ear that's now been informed by these practices and uh, notice how the quality of your relationship changes. And I remember the, in the first session, I asked you to think about some, someone or something that you'd like to impact with the quality of your listening. And I'm, I'm, I'm inviting you to notice if that happens for you uh, over the next few days and weeks uh, when, when you have these practices under your belt. 
And uh, notice how listing can impact the, the outcome of difficult conversations. And sometimes you don't even have to say much of anything for it to be, you just have to be that opening, open presence that will impact the quality of a conversation. So the handouts this week, there, there are a ton of them. Um, in, 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 in addition to the practices and reflections, I did the top 10, the 11 tips, and then the different types of conversation, the spiritual listening meditation. And then I did something on circle principles, a bibliography, some quotes, and uh, uh, something I call listening 101, which is a kind of a brief summary of everything that we did. And uh, this session will, is being recorded, so it will be available on the website and you'll, you should get your handouts tonight. And uh, tomorrow there will be a, a lunch, brown bag lunch at the McBride's home tomorrow. So anybody wants to join them for lunch and more discussion, that would be great. And then um, on Wednesday, uh, Diane has offered her home for anyone who would like to come in at two o'clock on Wednesday afternoon and continue the conversation as well. And so as we end this, I would love to have each of you just sort of reflect for a moment and have a one or two word insight that has come to you from the time we've spent together on our pilgrimage during Lent this year. One or two words. And if you could just say it or put it in the chat, that would be terrific. We can, we'll, we'll take just a couple extra minutes if that's okay with everybody before we close. Well, thank you, Lori. You wrote it in the chat. Wonderful. Anybody want to say it out loud? Did Judy? Uh, very interesting and intimate. Really loved it, Kay. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Kay? Yes. Um, I think this would make everybody a better reader as mm -hmm. well as a better listener. That reading is a kind of listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Diane, was your hand up? I was trying to write and I cut myself oh. off, but um, I do just really appreciate um, all the work you put into um, guiding us on this walk. And um, I really do feel that uh, It'll help help me with relationships and and beyond. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Uh, I'll just yeah, I'll just say that again. Thank you, Kay. Although I've only been here for two sessions, uh, now I really regret I couldn't make the other ones. So, but this was very revealing and I'm walking away with, darn it, something more I got to work on myself. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Never yeah, something more to improve myself. <laughs> All right, it's a good thing. It's a good thing, what a challenge. Yeah, good. Anything else? Brad? I mean, there's a ton that can certainly be said. And I will echo the thank yous. Uh, this has been awesome, especially during Lent. Um, it certainly enhanced my my journey in Lent. And I think it's like, I guess the big takeaway for me uh, is I like this idea that listening to me always seemed like something that I was doing to get something out of a conversation. Mm. What am what am I getting out of this? Mm. And it's kind of allowed me to better focus on yes and sometimes, you know, it can be it can be for you to get something out of, but it can be a gift for them, but it can also just be a gift for that person. Mm -hmm. And different conversations will have different um, mm -hmm. needs there, but it helps to really remember that last part about just be that gift for that person as you said be the be the midwife for their thoughts mm -hmm. I, I like that phrase mm 
it's a gift you always have with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? I would, I would underscore um, all of Brad's from both the gratitude to you, Kay, but also mm -hmm. the recognition that listening is a gift. Mm -hmm. But the other piece that's required for making it a gift is remembering that it's a choice. Mm -hmm. Because oh, if you don't remember it's a choice, then it can be just someone taking from you. Mm -hmm. And so the, the gift and the choice kind of feel like bookends for me, mm -hmm. which is something I hadn't really framed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Anything else? Lewis, is your hand up? Oh, you're muted. What I uh, uh, put it in the chat, but it's uh, but listen oh. for more than words. Hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, it's just been really a joy for me, and I just want to acknowledge you all for, for your listening and for being here, for being vulnerable, for opening up to each other, for just playing and uh, walking, walking the pilgrimage road together with us. It's just been a great community and wonderful for me, too, a great experience for me. So thank you very much for your listening, and uh, I just want to leave you with this invite the great mystery into your life uh, create more space for love and freedom to emerge hold space for patterns that connect spirit and soul dimensions are sources which make everything flow in new ways slowing down to find our rhythm our own natural rhythm spiritual listening is embodied listening we become a listener <laughs> presence to all of life. So remember being listened to is so close to being loved that most people cannot tell the difference. So thank you for your listening and thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you. And we blow out our candles as we leave this evening and take the light with us out into the world and into Holy Week next week. <laughs>